Right. <laughs> so we're continuing in uh, Matthew's Gospel and uh, continuing in chapter 9 again. And um, uh, next week, uh, Johnny will finish the chapter and take us into chapter 10. But uh, I'm reading today from verse 18, and if you're following in the Bibles uh, around about you, it's page 974. So 974, Matthew 9, from verse 18. While he, that's Jesus, was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I'll be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him over all that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Let's pray together. And Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for these things of which we read. And we pray that you would speak to us. Open our ears, open our hearts, that we might be challenged by meeting Jesus today, for we pray in his name. Amen. Um, I'm always amazed at, uh, at how calm Jesus remains when people seem to be incessantly interrupting him with all their demands. I don't know what you're like if you set off to do a task and then somebody says, hold on, just while you're doing that, will you just do this once you're finished? And uh, you, you, you kind of do one thing yourself on the next one. And another person said, oh, uh, just what about that? And then you get a text message reminding you to send this in the post. I don't know whether your brain can contain all those different demands. Mine certainly struggles. Um, and I easily kind of get myself into a bit of a flap when there's sort of people coming at me from different angles. Jesus here is uh, faced with incessant demand. He only begins to do one thing. And there's another load of people nagging him to do something else. Yet he seems to remain serene and calm and poised throughout it all. Well, the first interruption is this. Uh, last week we left Jesus talking with the disciples of John. But we're told, verse 18, while he was saying these things. In other words, he's still speaking. And somebody interrupts and said, oh, Jesus, you haven't got time for this. There's a, a real need. And it is a real need. It's an urgent need. It's a need of desperation. A young child has died. Now, we don't know too much about the biographical details from Matthew, but Mark and Luke tell us that this is the daughter of Jairus. Uh, we're pretty sure it's the same story. We know that Jairus is a ruler, which means that he's likely to be head of the, the synagogue or a kind of community uh, spokesperson, someone who is therefore well-respected in wider society. 
someone uh, to whom other people would pay uh, respect uh, and honour. But however much authority and respect he usually receives, he kneels at the feet of Jesus. The ruler came in, verse 18, and knelt before him. Remember the leper? Throws himself at the feet of Jesus, bows before Jesus and asks him to help. He pays Jairus, or whoever this man is, likely to be Jairus, pays Jesus extreme honour. And he recognises that there's something different, there's something other uh, about Jesus. Note his faith, he has a, a, a gentle confidence in the ability of Jesus to make a difference to this situation. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. There's no, I mean, this, this uh, happening must have been laced with emotion. But he simply expresses his need and his confidence that Jesus can change the circumstances. So in response to that gentle confidence, off goes Jesus. But no sooner as he you know, set two feet up the road when he's interrupted again. And this time, it's a bit more of a subtle interruption, but it's an interruption nonetheless. There's a woman. Verse 20 tells us loads about her and about her um, uh, context and setting. She's a, a lady that has had severe menstrual problems. Her menstrual flow is abnormally prolonged. She therefore may well be anemic. And of course, she would be considered ritually unclean. And in the context of the day, she should be, in people's understanding, common understanding, uh, shut away and out of contact with people until her menstruation is complete. But she can't do this because it won't stop. So no wonder then, because of all the suspicion... And all the nervousness about her, all the, the kind of, again, degrading looks, she creeps, we're told, up behind Jesus. She comes up behind him. Doesn't meet him face on, but there's a, a kind of a, I'll just kind of catch him <laughs> without him knowing. And uh, she doesn't want the indignity of being seen far off. Perhaps she's expecting... Uh, Jesus or somebody else to see her approaching and tell her to get lost and go back to where she should belong. Perhaps that would have been just too much heartbreak upon heartbreak for her to contend with. So she goes behind Jesus, hoping just to kind of catch him untowards. But her creeping up behind Jesus is faith-filled creeping up. Again, there's a gentle... Confidence, this man will make some difference to my situation. John Christostom, one of the early church fathers, said, uh, Though she was bound by her affliction, her faith had given her wings. So she's trapped socially, religiously. There's just something that gets her up and out and after this man, Jesus. And like the synagogue ruler uh, in public, she, with a little bit more discretion, has a confident faith in Jesus to change her situation. If I could just, verse 21, catch the hem of his garment, literally the tassel of his robe, tells us that Jesus is a, a law-obeying rabbi. He would wear the full shawl with various tassels on it as uh, the law instructed. Just catch the edge of one of those little tassels. And, but Jesus sees the woman. He notices, Luke and Mark tell us that he knows that power has gone out for him. Matthew doesn't bother with that detail, but what we do know is the most important thing. Jesus turns around and he looks her full in the face. No kind of brush off, go away woman, I don't want to bother with you. No, he turns and he sets his gaze upon her. She is important to Jesus. She's perhaps considered unimportant to everybody else. Unimportant at best. But to Jesus... She is seen and valued and her faith is vindicated. And so he pronounces public healing 
for her. Now, on first reading, we might think that's a little bit rude. You know, none of us would go to the doctor, would we, with, um, you know, something that's a bit embarrassing. You go into the doctor, you say to the doctor in the privacy of her room, I've got a bit of a problem with my piles or hemorrhoids or something, you know. You know? And, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, just think the shame if we doctor said, I'll just go wait in the waiting room, I'll come out with a prescription in a minute. And they come out saying, hello, Mr. Smith, here's your prescription for your hemorrhoid cream. You know, we Power. I remember once, uh, uh, this is a true story, and I hope that you won't um, uh, find it too distasteful and sack me, but, um, uh, but I, when Joseph was a little boy, still, you know, weeks old, um, uh, then uh, he, had a, he got a urine infection in his nappy, and uh, the, I remember we were prescribed by the health to some cream, so I went to the local chemist and I gave the pharmacist the prescription, and, uh, and she said, um, um, and what area is it for? I, don't, I think she thought I was Joseph, actually. Uh, but anyway, she, I, remember the, I remember this as clear as day. She said, what, she sort of went, what, and what area is this for? So I said, well, it's, it's for his penis. And she said, for the penis? Right, here we go. And, and there were about six other people in the pharmacy. They all looked. And I, anyway, thankfully it wasn't in where we lived, but I could have died. Uh, I am a little bit prudish, really, and I'm not, you know... Uh, comfortable discussing such matters and uh, if the floor could have opened up it would have done so here's Jesus this woman you know she she feels disgrace she feels embarrassment even in our society we don't talk very openly about such things and so she creeps up to Jesus she's secretly healed but no Jesus can't do with secret healing he pronounces healing for her isn't he a bit rude isn't he indiscreet well no Her private matter has had public and social consequences. She's been shut away. Society, the religious rulers have said she's got to be shut away. And by Jesus questioning and exposing her healing in public, he pronounces her clean in the sight of the community. So that not only is her body healed... But her relationships, her worship life, her, her community interaction is also healed as well. Now, interruption. Woman is dealt with, so to speak. And now Jesus goes back to what he was setting out to do in the first place. He's on the way to the ruler's house. And by the time Jesus gets there, verse 23, there's all sorts of commotion. We're told that when Jesus came to the house, he saw the flute players and the crowd, my Bible says, making a commotion. You could just imagine it. It was common in first century Palestine for professional mourners to gather, even at a poor person's funeral. to mark the passing. It was a big community event in their culture. Mourning was a very public thing. So Jesus arrives and all of this is well underway. And Jesus uh, says to them all, get out of the way. Go away, you're not needed anymore. For the girl is not dead, but she's asleep. We need to be aware of any sort of modern arrogance. Yes, there's been massive medical developments and growth in knowledge scientific knowledge since uh, the first century when this was most likely written but having said that the ancient people knew when people were dead they knew they're not just a little bit mistaken they're not ignorant they knew and Jesus reaches out his hand and she's raised up before this point Jesus is yet to raise the dead only the old testament Prophet Elijah and Elisha had been known to do this. Maybe uh, the ruler puts Jesus in that bracket in his mind by appealing to him uh, to help. But either way, Jesus reaches out his hand to this young girl. He went in, took her by the hand, and she arose. And again, as we've said for the last three weeks, That word arose, same word, root word for resurrection in Matthew. This is a resurrection moment. 
the new life, not just because this, this the girl who was dead is now alive and breathing again, but actually it's, it's a spiritual resurrection moment. The new life of the kingdom of God is breaking out. This girl shares in resurrection life. She shares in new life. She shares in, as we were saying on Sunday morning, that, that abundant, everlasting, eternal life that Jesus is bringing. And, and in her healing, no wonder the, the, the ruler's daughter's, uh, is, uh, what's happened to her is spreading throughout the region. But again, let's just look behind what's going on here. Look behind the surface. Dead bodies, menstruating women, were the two top things that you had to avoid if you wanted to be a good, pure and healthy Jew. And what does Jesus do? He touches the both. The woman's touched his clothing, and by extension has touched him. Jesus reaches out a hand to this little girl. Folks, there is no one that Jesus doesn't want to reach. There is no barrier that is too firm. No culture that is too far away. No distance he will not go. No person he won't seek out. Come uh, to my... What did we sing? Um, the Verse 3. Come to my heart, the wonderful love. Come and abide. No. Oh, I've forgotten it anyway. Um, Jesus is seeking, that's it. Jesus is seeking the wanderers yet. Sorry, I'm having a bad day. Uh, why do they roam? Love only waits to forgive and forget. Home, weary wanderer home? Something like that, you know. Um, oh, I'm going to have to read it. It's just I'm doing my nugget in if I can't remember it properly. Paul Smith would know it word perfect, wouldn't he? But um, he would, he would. Jesus is seeking the wanderers yet. Why do they roam? Love, I was right. Love only waits to forgive and forget. Home weary wanderers home. Wonderful love dwells in the heart of the Father above. There is a love beyond limits and it's embodied in Jesus crossing these social, spiritual, religious boundaries. There is nowhere too dark for him to go. No one outside of his reach. And just when Jesus thinks, right, well, that's that done for today. It's not a bad day's work, is it? Healing of a woman and the raising the dead. Yeah, I'll just go and have some tea now. Bit of cheese and crackers before bed. Uh, no, there are two more people. As he passed on from there, verse 27, two blind men followed him. Have mercy on me, son of David. Deliberate use of the word. A clear messianic statement. The Messiah was understood by the prophets and by the Jewish people of this time to be the one who brought in the new age. And one of the signs of the new age was healing. And again, Matthew was trying to, with a little sort of play on words, with a little bit of, of symbolic imagery, he's trying to say that these people who are blind have seen more about Jesus than a whole load of the people round about him that got nothing wrong with their physical eyesight. That these people, in affirming him, as the Davidic king, son of David, have seen something that others do not perceive. And because they see in him something different and distinctive, they recognise who he is, they plead then for mercy. R.T. France said that mercy is not an emotion, but it is a practical response to need. So Jesus doesn't just feel pity for them, he doesn't just think, oh, bless them. He gets to it. Do you believe that I could do this? You know, it goes unsaid what he's about to do, but you could, you could imagine, I don't know how it would be, because there wouldn't be a knowing glance, because they're blind, aren't they? But you know what I mean? There's this sense that these two men and Jesus both know what's going to happen. They know what he means. Do you believe that I can do this? Which fundamentally is the underlying assumption of these last two chapters. We read all these stories and the question that you and I are being asked is exactly the same. Do you believe that this man can do this? Do you believe that he can set people free? Do you believe that he can cross the boundaries to reach those that are lost? Do you believe that he can deliver the oppressed? Do you believe that he can forgive the sinner? Do you believe that he can heal the broken hearted and even raise up the dead? Do you believe? That is the question. 
Now, blindness, verse 29, uh, was uh, again another um, socially repulsive thing. It was categorised near leprosy in this culture. Once more, Jesus, what does he do? He touches the eyes. He touches that which is untouchable. Obliterates the social conventions. If you were a religious leader in this days, Jesus would be doing your nutting, wouldn't he? No one day, no wonder they're up in arms. You know, they can't deal with this man. Jesus says, according to your faith, literally in response to, not in proportion to, but in response to the fact that there is some faith here. He touches them and their eyes are opened and they can see. And you think, well, it must be done now. Surely now he's done. And then he finds a man who doesn't speak. As they were going away, behold. You know, if I was Jesus... I'd be kind of raised in my eyebrows. You know, there's some couple of people on a Sunday morning here, and um, uh, you know, I, I, there's no, I don't want anybody's sympathy at all. But you know, Sunday morning we kind of finish at twelve fifteen, and usually if I'm away by about half past one, I'm thinking I've done well. And there's a there's a couple of people that almost they wait till sort of like one twenty eight. <laughs> And then they think that is the moment to start telling you all about everything, which you've usually heard the week before as well. And, um, and uh, of course, a great and godly minister, somebody like David King, would just be, you know, of course, full of compassion and grace and understanding. And I, I work hard at my poker face, so I try to, you know, I've been to theological college, I've been trained in these things. You tilt your head. Mm, I hear what you say, you know. I'm trying to do all the stuff in, but I'm thinking, I want my lunch. <laughs> I'm hungry. I want my lamb sandwich or whatever it's going to be. I don't have lamb sandwiches. Uh, you know, I, 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 I want to get home, really. I'm looking at my watch, thinking we'll be back again in four and a half hours' time to do the evening. Uh, it's not a problem, of course not. But I wonder whether Jesus is thinking this. Oh, I'd just like to get off, actually. I wouldn't mind one of those suppers with the tax collectors and sinners. They usually put on a good show. So he thinks he's done, and then there's another man who comes. Here we go again. And Jesus, of course, is full of compassion and patience. It's not a problem to him. (laughs) Good reminder to us that if we're ever tempted to think that God might be fed up or weary with us, he's always always got a little bit more compassion, always got a little bit more grace, always got a little bit more patience. And... We're told, verse 32, that um, this is a demon-possessed man who was mute and brought to him. The focus in the passage is on deliverance rather than healing. And the people of the first century often thought that um, uh, being nonverbal was a byproduct of demonic oppression. So they instinctively think that 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 is what's going on. And Jesus pronounces healing and deliverance and freedom for this man. And he begins to speak. That's the tenth miracle since the Sermon on the Mount. And Frederick Bruner says, it's as though Jesus is saying, so then, are you convinced yet? (laughs) What about you? How do you respond to this Jesus? Faith in all these passages is shown to be a practical confidence in the power of Jesus. So faith is never some general ethereal belief in the existence of God. Instead, it is getting in touch with the Jesus uh, with Jesus by bringing one's major need to him with the expectation that he can do miracles with it. It isn't faith that heals, God does the healing. But the question that is leaping out at you and me, and perhaps people that are in the crowds watching these things, is what about your faith? What do you believe 
What do you believe this Jesus can do? The dead are brought to life, the blind have got sight, the mute have got voice. What more convincing do people need? Yet still, the last verse of today tells us that the Pharisee said he casts out demons by the prince of demons. In other ways, the Pharisees are very clear that this is not the way that God does things. And therefore they cannot accept Jesus as being sent from God. He's doing things that are literally out of this world. And if he's not from God, then we must logically conclude, they must logically conclude that his power is from another source. And so again, we're confronted. What about us? What do we think? We've heard about the experience of the people at the centre of these miracles. We've heard about people watching on who are saying, why does he do this? Why does he eat and drink with these people? Why does he touch those people when he shouldn't be? We've heard the Pharisees, they've made their conclusion, and it's all downhill for Jesus, so to speak, from this point on. What about us? What do we think? Matthew, of course, is an evangelist. He's presenting these stories about Jesus to convince us who Jesus is. We kind of, years on, perhaps we are convinced. We read this as kind of teaching instruction. Well, its first purpose, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, their first uh, purpose was to appeal to people to convince them to believe. That's the first purpose of the gospel. Good news. It's asking us, who is this Jesus? And what do you really, really When you get to the nub of the matter, what do you really believe he can or can't do? Let's pray together. Lord, we recognise amidst this room that there'll be so many of us with need perhaps for healing, perhaps for courage and comfort. Perhaps we're weighed down with the burden of a loved one. Lord, whether we feel like coming like Jairus did, boldly, desperately, in full view, Or whether we're worried about what may happen and so we come with creeping, faithful but creeping nonetheless, behind your back. We come to you, the one who is healer and deliverer and saviour and Lord. We pray that you would grant us the gift of faith. And that you would give us confidence that not a single one of us is too unclean or too sin prone. Not a single one of us has got too much baggage. Not a single one of us is too far away that you won't reach out to touch and heal, to save and restore. And so give us practical confidence, O God, in this Jesus. More and more our lives might be permeated and positioned as those who rely and depend faithfully on him. We pray in his precious name. Amen.